Well, an extra $10 billion a year and more than 26,000 jobs could be added to Australia's GDP each year. That's if the government advances a bioenergy roadmap. That's the estimate from a fresh report commissioned by Bioenergy Australia. It warns the country could be exposed to environment and energy security risks if a domestic renewable fuel sector is not developed. Joining me live is Bioenergy Australia CEO Shahana McKenzie. Thanks very much for your time. So uh, I guess interesting when we step back and look at this, everything seems geared towards electrification. Mm. So cars, um, even, you know, at home, no longer using gas. So do we really need that much liquid fuel? Can we sort of skip a bit of this? Yeah, so look, I think what we need to consider is the hard to abate sectors that don't have other options. They either don't have options available now and for some of those sectors, it is looking like it is a very long way off. So if you consider aviation as an example, you know, in order for aviation to hit its net zero target, it is sustainable aviation fuel is going to have to take the lion's share. It is going to have to play a significant role. Unfortunately, electrification and hydrogen are just not going to be able to play big roles in even the medium term to be able to support those sectors. So maybe one day, but the the mechanics and physics around getting a plane up in the air for now is beyond battery. So what would sustainable fuel be? How sustainable can that make that industry, for example? Yeah, so, I mean, the sort of fuel that we're talking about is you're looking at around an 80% reduction in emissions based on traditional fossil fuel. So through the life cycle analysis of the production of that fuel, that's where you're achieving that emissions reduction. And making it out of? Oh, look, a range of different feedstocks. So uh, as an example, Australia's used cooking oil, our export of used cooking oil from Australia into the US market has increased by 33,000% in the last two years, and that is specifically being driven through the production of renewable fuels out of the US. So it could be used cooking oil, it could be the tops and trash from the sugarcane industry, it could be the diversion of organics that would otherwise be going to landfill. Um, there are a range of different feedstocks, and really anything you can imagine that is an organic residue or waste stream um, can be used to produce these liquid fuels for all of those sectors, heavy haulage, aviation, mm. mining, agriculture. If it's such a good answer then, what, what, what's happening? What's missing right now? We've got fuel emission standards which are slowly looking like they'll, they'll change and have an impact. Is that sort of missing element here? No, well I think, I mean, the government uh, inherited, needed to do quite a bit of catch up on energy policy when they came into play. So there's a lot of focus that has been on the decarbonisation and the enabling of our electricity sector to be able to decarbonise that. What we need the government to do now is to is to really have a parallel approach of decarbonising our liquid fuel sector at the same time. We shouldn't wait to get electricity done and then move on to the other sectors. Is liquid... that subsidies that this comes down to? Look, money from the government or well, I mean, I think it's a range of it's a range of different solutions that are going to enable it. The the recent announcement around two billion dollars. $2 billion for hydrogen was obviously a really welcome announcement for, for progressing hydrogen deployment in Australia. Um, similarly, we need to have a similar approach for liquid fuels. It accounts for 45% of our energy mix, liquid fuels. We, we need to take a focus on actually really supporting these hard-to-abate sectors, achieving decarbonisation. Shane McKenzie, we've got to leave it there. Thanks for your time today. Thanks so much.